Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for being here with us tonight. Um, this is tonight we're having our conversations with artists series and we are featuring uh, the wonderful Martha Jackson Jarvis. Um, before we begin, I would like to acknowledge, though I am here um, in my living room in Northeast DC, our physical building of the Phillips Collection is situated upon the ancestral and unceded lands of the Piscataway people, and we would like to pay our respects to their elders, both past and present. This living land acknowledgement reminds us of the significance of place, the continued existence of Indigenous and other people, and the museum's commitment to building respectful relationships with those who call these lands home today. Tonight's program is part of our Conversation with Artists series, which is one of our hallmarks of our dynamic partnership with the University of Maryland. 2021 marks the sixth year of collaboration, and with this partnership, the Phillips and the University of Maryland made a fundamental commitment to promote the best of both our institutions. Following tonight's conversation, our guest Martha Jackson Jarvis will be having studio visits with MFA candidates at the University of Maryland. Um, so I've told you uh, quite a few things and you don't know who I am yet. My name is Erica Harper. I am head of PK-12 initiatives here at the Phillips Collection. Um, I am an, an educator. I'm a dreamer with a heavy side of logic and an avid reader. I'm a big sister with the sensibilities of an only child, a country girl from Memphis, a daughter and granddaughter, and my son is in Virgo. Uh, tonight, we also have Nehemiah Dixon, who is the Director of Community Engagement here at the Phillips Collection. Nehemiah has had the unique, very unique experience of starting this job in the midst of a global pandemic. So it's been quite the ride for him. Nehemiah is first and foremost an artist. He is an ideas person. He is a black man, a husband, a son, and a brother. He is a loyal friend and also an avid player of Magic the Gathering. And our illustrious <laughs> guest for the evening, Martha Jackson Jarvis. Um, her work can be seen near and far from right here in DC all the way to Moscow. She is a black woman, an artist, both a sculptor and a painter. Uh, she is a mentor, a mother, a wife, a sister, and she is a gardener and a child of the country. Um, so with that, uh, Nehemiah, I would love for you to kick us off and tell us about the first time you remember meeting Martha. Oh God, that was... Uh... It had to be 2012, 2013. Um, I met Mar uh, Martha because we were, I, I was working on an exhibition with uh, Alonzo Davis, uh, Public Art Concepts. And uh, Alonzo wanted me to meet her and ask if she would be part of that exhibit. And so I, I nervous and didn't think she was gonna say yes because uh, it was a small establishment we were uh, curating out of. Um, but she did, she said yes. And, and ever since then, she's been a mentor from up and a mentor from afar. I've, I've followed her work for, for years and it's just such an honor to be sitting here with you today in 2021 uh, to hear about your life's work and, and to celebrate you today. Um, so Martha, uh, I, I, I have to know, uh, how, how, how are you? How, how's everything going? I'm well, thank you. That's, that's really important to be able to say today, but I'm well, my family's well, and we've weathered the storm with the COVID and we're all come out on the other side of it, so. That's awesome. Um, so I know that you you work out of the Gateway Arts District in Mount Rainier, um, yeah. and you are among uh, many talented artists. Um, how long have you been working and living in DC? Area. Yeah, I came to Washington, D.C. in 1970 uh, to attend Howard University. So, um, and then I left Howard and went back to Philadelphia for a while. And then returned, like permanently, I think, in around 70, um, five, so, yeah, something like that. So it's been home for a number of years. Um, I love Washington, D.C. It's um, close enough to New York, yet far enough away from New York. Um, it's um, simply located, I think, on the East Coast, which I love. And um, it has its own flavor. Um, I've always been struck with the fabulous architecture here in Washington, D.C. Um, all home, 
uh, it's a big city, yet it still has a small town feel somewhat. And yet there's an international feel as well. And I love Washington because you can still see the sky. The architecture has not been so overshadowed. So for a painter and for artists, we often talk about the light here in Washington, DC, which is unique. And it is a wonderful place. Uh, the museums are absolutely world-class and they're a treasure. It's a living treasure that I valued and that um, really uh, influenced me in terms of wanting to live and raise my children here in Washington, DC, having access, free access, I might add, to all the museums of the world. Uh, and that was important. I raised my children in and out of every one of those museums. They probably could lead a tour of each one of them. Uh, but it's just been a treasure and a resource. So what, um, you moved to DC in the 70s. Um, or in, in, to Howard, um, where were you, where, where did you grow up? Um, I grew up early on, I always have, I have multiple li lives, <laughs> it's like a cat. Um, I grew up in, uh, originally in Lynchburg, Virginia. Um, there, lived there with my grandparents, I was born there for a while, and then I lived there until I was about 13, and I moved to Philadelphia, so I have this country really rural country, the foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains experience. And my first real love and encounter with nature and the possibility of building and growing things became really apparent from that early years and watching uh, my grandparents in the small community be totally almost self-sufficient in how they made things. They made whatever was necessary for themselves. Um, and then uh, later, I moved to Philadelphia when I was a teenager. That was a, a culture shock. But again, one learns. So I learned that there were such things as museums and symphony and uh, jazz clubs and all the things that a big city could offer. And Philadelphia itself has a long history of being um, uh, a lot of peoples from all over the world have migrated to Philadelphia. So this big industrial town, you know, in the shadow of New York in many ways, but that industry was there, um, that architecture, and then the peoples, uh, many communities that you could see uh, Italian culture, you could see Greek culture, you could experience all of these things simultaneously uh, within the city core and I, I loved Philly for that. And also Philadelphia had a, a tremendous amount of artists, musicians, music has always been paramount in Philadelphia. Um, from the symphony to the crooners standing on the corner singing, you know, the sound of Philadelphia, the jazz musicians, uh, John Coltrane, Sun Ra, they all came through Philadelphia. So that verb of Philly really impacted my life later on in terms of color, if you will, you know, the color to life, you know, that energy. Oh, so I, I sort of see um, that, that life experience in, in your work, uh, this, this contrast of nature and, and steel of the city, this industrial sort of breath that you bring to your work. Um, even looking at this first slide here, um, can you talk about this first? And, and maybe why this is the slide that you chose to go first? Oh, well, I was have this as kind of a drawing. I, I use this, uh, I make this ink from uh, the black walnut tree. I get the, um, the walnuts when they fall from the tree and boil them down and distill it. And it comes up with this deep, dark uh, ink that I use very much in my drawings and composite. I like to think of it as, um, it's very interesting. In painting, you often talk about uh, flesh tones and usually that flesh tone was usually pink and beige and that sort of thing. So for me, after uh, kind of brewing and distilling this, uh, uh, the black walnut inks, I arrived at what I thought was the absolute perfect uh, kind of skin tone uh, of African people. You can take it from light beiges to darks and blacks. So there was something about that rhythm that I loved and I love the immediacy of it. So this is one of my drawings. I just kind of, it's almost like um, 
doing calligraphy in a way. They work very on, on um, very dense paper, and it's very it's very fast. You know, the inks kind of the paper drinks the, the inks, and and I like that feel. So I just started with kind of a, a name. There. So this piece um, is entitled. Um, I think it, who knows? It was part of a, a series of, of drawings. I may have done fifty of them. Uh, as I said, they're spontaneous. I almost never work on uh, one work. It's always like a, a, a body or continuously. And it's almost like a choreography as well, moving from one form to the next, one painting to the next, one drawing to the next. I like to capture the energy of the moment. Um, Would you say it's the energy of the city or the energy of the hills of Virginia? This painting? A little bit of both. Uh, and here I'm using some um, images of um, coral. I collected these specimens of, of like drawings. I really like this period, like in Victorian times when they were really discovering the world and this traveling and um, pre-photography pretty much. You know, artists were asked to record nature, to do these drawings. And I'm really struck with these beautiful drawings that these artists have done. And again, once you introduce the human hand or the human eye, it's a human interpretation. And oftentimes these things are not exact to nature, but they become this um, distilling through the human eye and through the human hand. So I, I really love these working with these kind of older uh, graphic images. And I often uh, cut them out and use them in collage in many ways. It's quite striking a uh, piece of work. Um, you, um, I, I thought it was interesting um, in talking to uh, Erica and you earlier, being asked to, I, we said I'm getting three images. So I said, oh my God, how am I <laughs> 46, <laughs> almost 50 years of work down to three images. So I distilled it down to these. And I, 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 I had it over on you can you can uh, we're, we're quite happy with the amount of images so <laughs> okay. Um, well, a, a question for you Martha. Um, yes. And I love that you started with one of your works on paper Well, we haven't said so far right you do public works you do works on paper installations. you sort of run the whole gamut. Um, and you know your works on paper. And you, you kept saying a choreography and you do it fast right it's this sense of movement in it that you know never feels static never ever feels flat and now we're looking at one of your public works um you told nehemiah and i um such a moving story about these works so i'm hoping you can tell us a little bit about what we're seeing and maybe relay that story for us oh yeah um this was um again i i as you, erica just said i do um paper works on paper studio works in public arts this is one of the pieces that i think um, really speak to me, Music of the Spheres. It was commissioned by Fannie Mae in uh, 2000. I started in 2000, 2001, we completed it. it took a year to build, construct all of them and build them. 2001 that they were installed. And it's called Music of the Spheres. And I uh, kind of uh, pulled out, usually when I do each of the project, public projects, I end up with this accumulation of almost a, a book uh, uh, of all of the documentation that it takes to bring an idea from a, 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 a basic sketch to um, engineering drawings, site drawings, photography, thousands of meetings and all of those things. It goes into this composite of how to construct almost a contemporary urban space in many ways. I, I'd like to think about music of the spheres as a way of creating poetic space within the cityscape. Uh, this was an open plaza. It was one of the um, headquarters of uh, Fannie Mae then. And it was, they had just built sort of the, the uh, metro there. That's the Van Ness metro that you come out onto this plaza. So I, I came up with music of the spheres. And usually I try to make this connection between uh, where the place that we are on earth. That's the question I ask, where are we? My place on earth. Um, and I try to cite it in terms of history, in terms of science, in terms of mythology. What is it about that site that begins to speak? 
So uh, music of the spheres, I thought about this notion that, um, that music of the spheres was a system of ideas and theories about the order of the universe. And that I wanted to introduce into this really urban, almost static plaza, if you will. It was just all concrete, steel, and glass. And I wanted to introduce these um, natural materials. Uh, these, the 10 foot um, sphere is constructed of, of course, concrete and steel with inner core, but then there's a, a, a skin that's laid on each one of the spheres. And the 10 foot one is a polished carnelian stone. And then the eight foot one, which is the blue, the dark indigo blue is Italian glass tesseract. And then the greenish ones are these Indonesian uh, jade stones, which are uh, natural stones that's been kind of uh, kissed by water. So they're all rounded and smooth and you get this really tactile quality. Um, and I talked about the day that we were finishing up installing them, of course, with all the cranes had left and we set them down and we had to tile the very tops. And I was finishing it up and I heard this, I, I got down off the ladder and I heard this tapping around the side of like the large sphere. And I got down, I walked around and there was this gentleman with his, uh, uh, a blind gentleman, he had his cane, his, you know, hitting, tapping the sphere. And he had a, a, another woman, a friend was with him. And apparently he was going, he was blind and he was going, usually he walks through that empty plaza to go to a class there near the University of District of Columbia. And after we set the spheres, he got off of his normal bus route and he started to walk through the plaza. And of course he encountered the spheres. And he said to me, I missed my entire class because I spent it walking around feeling the spheres to, in, to uh, interpret them. And so the next day he had brought a sighted friend with him so she could see them. So I thought this was so paramount for me in terms of the power of public work yeah. to really speak to the individual, the humanness of us that we want to touch, we want to feel, needless to say, for all the museums here, I'm one of the people that the guards say, miss, you're too close to the artwork. You can't touch it, don't breathe hard on it. And of course you want to almost inhale it. So it's extraordinary to be able to create public work that belongs to everyone in the public sphere, a common area that can be experienced and discovered and become very personal. And to me, that was the ultimate um, reckoning, if you will, about uh, creating public work and why I should continue. Uh, and I, subsequent to that, Fannie Mae did install the whole story about music of the spheres in braille on the walls there, such that non-sighted people could read the story and read the script as well. Um, so for me, that was an, 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 a powerful moment. Um, and this was an open plaza in, in, in terms of just any urban corner, it could happen. Yeah. That for me is the magic of public work. You can excite uh, a very ordinary place and turn it into a magical site. Something that becomes memorable, something that becomes uh, part of the landscape of human memory. For me, it makes me think a lot about how, you know, since I'm in the education department, you know, we're always slow looking, slow down and look at the art and take it all in. And you think about it being at a metro and people rushing to and fro, you know, as we do in our busy, busy lives and just sort of having this, you know, these, these sculptures here that kind of force you to, to slow down and take your time and look at them. Yeah. Um, and you get to touch them, right? What you don't get to do yes. in the buildings. Yeah. Just yes. sort of contrast to me uh, with uh, Richard Serra's work that was put up in the, in the 80s in New York where you know there was a public uproar about um, it blocking the path and it's just uh, incredible that you know someone who this should have been an obstruction to um, found joy and beauty and, and in fact invited other people to experience and it just um, says a lot of, of the, the connection of like what you named them the fact that um, you discovered him because he was tapping on them and and it just there's like a pattern there um you you a few words that rang out uh to me were 
um, unit the the universality of uh, or connecting this these to the to the cosmics, um, and I sort of see that sort of echoed throughout your two D works as, and as far as your three D works. Um, how do you how did you connect music to the cosmos? What what does that mean to you? Um, it's um well again oftentimes I start with myth. And, 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 and lore, you know, at the beginning of stories, just stories that could be told, you know, and told through history. And uh, for me, the music of the spheres is sort of, you know, you can, it dates back to Babylonian, the premise of the cosmos is composed of seven spheres. Pythagoras, who's in 543, founded the idea that the universe could be expanded by musical. Um, and then Plato talks about the path of the heavenly body, and then it moves through history and through human time to Kepler, who talks about the harmonies of the world, the birth of the modern astrophysics. So here we move from myth and storytelling around the campfire, and maybe the myth, and it's moved, that story has it weaves itself through humanity, and it ends up from myth to astrophysics. You know, I love that that bridge. So I try to make that connection that things are born of some reality, no, ma no matter how far-fetched the story or the, the legend, it's born of some truth. And I like unearthing some of that continuum. And it really speaks about the human continuum and how we discover, how we make discoveries in our environment. Like, the, the, the gentleman who was discovering through, uh, he, he could see further than I could see, you know, with his fingertips and with his cane, right? And then our, how we perceive things, I guess that's the thing that I try to work with. What is it that we are experiencing as we look at something, as we touch something, as we hear something? And I talked about music a little bit about Philadelphia. I, I learned that I almost never create work without having a soundtrack going, you know, music. There's something about the elevation that happens, you know. There is space that's opened up with sound. I think only sound can do that in open space the way that it does. And it almost, it does it in a universality, you know, about it doesn't belong to any one people. You can hear music from all over the world and it can speak to you. Um, I think one of my favorite saying is, I think Dizzy Gillespie was talking about his first encounter with Chano Pozo. And he said, I didn't speak a word of Spanish and he didn't speak a word of English, but that music that they sat there and created together and that legend, you know, reverberates around the world and through cultures. So I think for me, music has that immediate transformative quality. Uh, and visually, I'm always trying to approximate it somehow. One last question about this yeah. slide. What song do you hear when you when you when you stare at these your installation? Oh, it's multiple. It's um, uh, one of my favorites is parts of Equinox, uh, John Coltrane's Equinox. You hear that, and you can hear a love supreme. You can hear some of that recountedness. You hear the the little beat, or you hear the beat of raindrops. Growing up in the country, one of my favorite sounds was we had a tin roof, and when it would rain, there was a symphony. <laughs> that I never forget. And um, so I hear that, the rain on the tin roof. And if you've never treated yourself to a rainstorm on a tin roof, before you leave this planet, hear it. We only on slide number two. This is amazing. <laughs> OK, this was, um, this is called millstones. And I put this slide in because Again, when I talk about our place on earth, I'm always like, where am I in, in location? You know, what is it about this 
specific site that I'm standing in or that I'm asked to um, participate in? What is it that's happening? This was a piece that I built in Laurel, Maryland. They were gonna build, a, they built a beautiful, extensive library in, uh, there and they had incorporated art. Uh, and I, this was long before anything was there, I came out to the community. It's a very old community, black community uh, along Laurel there. And I was struck with the history there uh, of um, the beginning of this area. How, where did it grow? How did it come? And I was struck with this notion of the old millstones and usually the beginning of a city or sprung from once a mill was built, usually near a water source of, source of water, that has to be present, you know, humans, you gotta have water. So again, that place on earth, it has to be strategic. It's located near water. And those huge stones that the grist mill, right? That, that was churn and would ground all the grains and things that the farmers would make. And from this one object, that's grist mill, a whole town could spring, a whole industry could grow, could blossom. So I was struck with the beginnings of this very elegant, basic, we've seen the millstones, you see them sometimes just kind of laying flat. And here I turned it on its edge and of course blew it up. It's like eight feet in diameter and three feet deep. And like each one of these little glass tessera are hand cut like into little tie, little, uh, and set in this, um, again, Native American pattern. Is it African pattern? You can find this chevron pattern almost in every culture. There's some basket, I, I, I thought about the, the basket tree of the, the Native people from that area as well. And I wanted to incorporate it into that each little piece that goes into each little piece of cut glass, each, um, I think in the African tradition, they talk about the Makisi when like every time you put a stroke in, there's a meaning to it. There's an energy that goes into the documentation of the piece. So I wanted it to be laden with this energy that had built that community, piece by piece, stone by stone, glass by fragment by fragment. And again, the millstone. And I, here you can see the center core uh, and there was a little, kind of clapboard church that, that was still there and it was over a hundred years old. And I positioned the millstone. So when you look through the cog in the center, you saw the steeple and everything of that little church that was central to that community's growth. So all of these things come into play and come into, it's like a, a symphony, you know, I, I, can, I, I would liken it to a conductor. You know, you have to, the French horns are here and the, you know, the, the violins are there and how do you orchestrate these things? How do you bring together all of these energies to tell the story, this narrative of this place? So that was Millstone. There's almost a, a creation. I was gonna ask you about the, the, the symbol in the middle. Um, there's almost a creation story in, in the way you describe the, the blossoming and the flowering and even connected to your, your last, uh, last slide where uh, the search for spirituality within the, the almost repetition and the, the patterns and the secret, the rhythm of your, your works. Um, yeah. Yeah. And the shift in color. Yeah. Um, is, is striking. Why at, why at the at the connection where, where the steel meets the stone have the shift? Just out of curiosity. Uh, that becomes like the, the, the core, almost like the navel, if you will, you know, the, 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 the central core. And then again, I'm always toying between is it a cross? Uh, you know, it could be the four moments of the, the sun, it can be a cross. And then actually it's about industry, you know, uh, it's a mechanical fixture. So all of the above, it becomes more than one thing, the complexity of form, right? It can read, right? When we position it so that you see the church steeple through it, 
one has an association possibly of spirituality, or religion. But I can get religious experience from seeing, a, a, you know, steel and, and, and trinkets and, and tools and all of those things. So it's like the complexity of, of what it takes to, to, uh, to, to make um, our environment, you know. Um, and then you asked about the color. Um, the color in this particular piece, it's that you can see in the landscape around it, I had, so it would, it kind of dissolves into the color, like the, the brown of the, the pigment there. But then each one of the little pieces cut a glass, it's kind of iridescent. And as the sun travels around it, it catches the light. So there is like movement and inflection, you know, as you, as the day, the sun courses across the site. Um, and then I wanted to really kind of um, in on itself in a way, you know, is it, is it growing in or is it growing out? So maybe there's a complexity of, of directional pulls. So that's how I use the color in the patterning. It goes from really intimate, tiny little pieces of glass. We almost went crazy trying to cut it, but it looked beautiful. And so that was maybe my last silly question. How many pieces of glass do you think are? Oh my God, if I counted, I'd be <laughs> suicide. So I never count. <laughs> we just work. <laughs> no, no counting. Okay. <laughs> Now I, I look at a, a space and I here. say we have to fill that space and that's the number. <laughs> I've seen you in the studio working. Um, I put you in the middle of your pro uh, one project. Um, I don't know what year it was, but um, just the the organization of all the different materials and it's almost like set up like a uh, like a meatpacking plant or, or just like a, a factory, you know. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I like that a meatpacking. <laughs> so what's I mean, your like, I would kill nothing. How how do you first of all like to imagine something at that scale, um, but working in materials so like tiny? Um yeah. How do you how do you, how do you control like, yeah, what yeah. materials to use and apply it to that scale? Like how do you get there? Yeah. Now the sense of scale is really important. I always say I got my sense of scale from being in the, the country, you know, because the landscape is totally open, breathless, and you can see horizon, and you can look down a road as far as you can see, and you can look at the forest, and, you know, it's taller than you can ever imagine being as a, a, a child, you know. Uh, so the sense of scale, I'm always reckoning with the sky, right? So scale can be whatever it needs to be. And um, so I like to go from the a large scale to an intimacy, you know, this passage between being really large scale, but at the same time, it's really about intimate individual uh, cumulative energy that happens, that goes into the pieces. Um, and there's something, there's something interesting. Now, I made a joke about counting, but there is something really important about the counting. I don't count it in terms of um, the quantity or the number, but I do the counting in terms of the, the rhythm, almost like um, a, a, a rhythm of patterning that happens. Maybe it happens in music because they, they do the scales and they see that there's something that happens in terms of density and um, spatial directions. Um, sort of like I, a syncopation. Yes, and, and it's, um, and usually the site demands, it also, it speaks to what's, what's necessary, what will stand, what will not disappear, what, how much of a presence do you want it to have? So scale becomes really paramount and that's something that I, I often grapple with, you know, um, and to be able to um, work with it. I, I don't want to like use the word control it, but to work with it, to be able to manipulate it so that it's working. It's working for the site. It's not too big. It's not too small. 
too small can be dangerous and too big can be just as dangerous. So you have to really, there's a balance that has to happen. You know, there's a weighing of um, the terms. And then of course, there's the budget. <laughs> <laughs> I hear that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Should I move on? Sure. Okay. Now I put this one in because it's sort of this one of these in-between pieces. Now the the works that I showed previous to this, they were commissioned, right? Uh, someone said this is the site, uh, and then I'd have to think and design and go back and this is studio work. Uh, this is although it's three-dimensional and it's huge. I still had this notion. I, I was. I, I, I. This piece was important to me, and it's called. Um, Point of entry, note on the James River, and I. I would often when I'm driving south, you drive down 95, and if you can, at one point, you can kind of look over without crashing your car or your truck. And there's part of the James River and it's all these little islands sitting off in there. And I went there once and I was really struck with, I found this, this is, a, it's a, this is in the center here, there is a photograph on aluminum, it was translated onto aluminum metal so I can put it in the core there. And I photographed this tree, it was an old tree. And it's hard to see from just the scale here, but its roots were like dipping down like fingers into this into the James River. And I thought I spent the day there just photographing and looking at it. And it was after we had had a big storm. So all this, I love this point, all this debris had kind of washed up from the river. So it was all along the banks and encrusted into the, the, the trees. So I photographed those things. And then I had this notion about, when I say the works, I try to bridge time and space and history and science all at one. Then I thought about this tree, what it had seen in its history of standing a sentinel on the, the shore of the James River. And I thought about, 1919 of the first Dutch frigate coming up the James River with the first cargo of African captured people. And I thought some tree witnessed that, you know, some of this debris witnessed that. And I wanted it to almost feel like a portal, like you were looking into a sea portal. If you on a ship, you can look through this portal and see this vision. And the second core is thousands of tiny little limestone pieces of, of, of cut tessera uh, that I had gotten in Italy. And then the outer core is a white quartz stone that's kind of prevalent in Virginia, that quartz stone. And these are just pebbles. And then I walked, just walking through that forest and the river, I collected all these sticks that became part of it. So um, this piece, and this was exhibited at the Katzen Museum. So for me, it was very um, kind of poignant, if you will, a window into time, a window into um, a narrative that's recorded in the landscape. I'm forever intrigued with things don't disappear. They submerge themselves in um, many interesting ways in the landscape. And they're ever present, you know, in our modern times. We miss a lot by not looking. Uh, so I'm always trying to unearth some of the narrative, some of the story. And for this, for me, this piece was um, important in terms of being able to, to tap into that and, and have that core moment and experience. Martha, you've um, twice now used the word unearth, and I want to talk a little bit about earth, right? And, you know, when we spoke earlier, I was saying to you how, you know, it is 
earth, right? It's just so present in all your works, even things that are made of heart, carnelian and glass and all of these. And here we have these twigs. Can you just talk a little, you know, and even some of your public works are literally coming out of the ground, right? They are part of the landscape in which they sit. And I was hoping you could just talk to us a little bit about sort of the, the importance of connection to the earth that seems to exist, and correct me if I'm wrong, in all of your works. Oh, you're not wrong. I think that's, 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 that's right on with it in terms of, um, it is the, you know, it is the anchor, it is the source, it is the um, repository, if you will, of um, energy and artifacts. <clears throat> I'm always viewing things as artifacts. For some reason, I'm always, I'm here in the present, but there'll be a time when it's not here and I'm not here and you're not here and, you know, but someone will unearth it. You know, when I think of um, fragments, I love the notion of fragments of a thing, you know, and you can get a lot of identity just from a single fragment of a thing. And most of our history has been reconstructed from fragments and portions, parts of a thing. And for me, the earth, is like this incredible vault or repository. You know, it's constantly um, churning and regrowing itself, uh, decaying. The notion of um, rebirth and decay it becomes really important. I, I like to see things consuming, and at the same time, there's a rebirth that happens. Uh, and only Earth can really present that, you know, in, in such a profound way. Uh, to all things, whether it's um, an organic thing or an inorganic thing. I just recently had some photographs of uh, some old farm equipment and I like to go into the, the forest and, and photograph like old vernacular architecture that's decaying and being reconsumed by the earth. You know, first the vines take over and that's growing and it's kind of being re introduced into the earth again and something will remain you know some part will remain uh, and I'm always intrigued with that um, that lineage from um, the birth of construction of a thing the new life of a thing it's glowing it's new and then you know there's this process of decay and warmness and intimacy that happens. There's an intimacy that starts to happen with the object or form when decay happens. There's almost uh, two, two things. Um, I see a cell, but I also see a universe, right? And uh, the word that comes to mind is like back to the future for some reason, um, as you were explaining um, the, the materials uh, and I don't know if you noticed, but you, you transported materials from Italy, right? But in, in, in telling the story, you also talked about the, the transatlantic slave trade. So this exchange of a commodity in order to create. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the move on. There was a question there, but I mean, it, those are the, like sort of the connections that I saw. Also, I see an eyeball. I see it, it's almost like you know, something is supposed to happen to your core when you approach this, right? Like, it's like yeah. that movie, was it The Never Ending Story, like of just approaching something very ominous and powerful. And there's a, an exchange of spirit or an exchange of soul um, once you peer into like this sort of looking glass of, of the past and I guess the present, because you took the- Yeah, yeah. And, you know, there's always a story that comes, a narrative that comes, the piece that's to the, the, the left, the far left, that image was of, um, part of a bridge that was, it was just like part of a trellis. Again, when I talk about the evidence in the landscape and I didn't know this, right? So I photographed it. And as I said, I, these photographs were taken after this huge storm. So all this debris had washed up. So all these, um, you can't see it here but they look like bones uh, interwoven in this portion of a trellis. 
So I was giving a lecture at Lafayette College and at Curly Raven Holton's um, uh, invitation. Um, I was there giving the lecture and I'd done a, a, a print there. And in the audience was this gentleman who had funded um, the, um, I guess the scholarship that had invited me to come there to speak. And when I showed this photograph and talked about this area, this was where his home was. And he said, and I said, I photographed this because these things look so much like bones. He said, as a boy, there was a huge train wreck that happened there. And all these people were interred there and they never got them out. So this was a fragment of this bridge. And I, all these bones had, they looked like bones, but they were dried twigs and branches of trees. And I never forgot that story. So again, these stories that follow these things, it's not myth, that's history. He lived as a boy, his mother told him the story. And so I thought, it's so interesting when these things take on a, um, a narrative or a life right. beyond the moment, right? You're working with the past and you're working with the present and then you're working with the future as well. So Martha, that was, oh, yeah. Sorry. No, that's it. Can we talk about, um, and again, here's a, I'm making an assumption here. You tell me if I'm wrong. I'm hoping we can talk about the next four-ish slides together. So mm -hmm. when, first of all, I would love to use those with kids. Those are like the perfect kind of works that I like to sit kids in front of and say, what do you see here? And just have them sort of point out all the different ones. And I think, again, so we're looking at a 2D one, um, but you know, this movement, this, this, oh, it's nothing that's ever static, even when yours are flat again. So here's, you tell me if I'm right. Here's what I saw in some of the other ones too. I kept getting this sense of animals. Like it was giving me safari. I thought I saw some elephant tusk in some and the stripes kept made me think about zebras or, or what is it, opaki, the copies um, that sort of look like zebras. So you tell me how, how on I am with those and maybe go through some of the other ones and just show, tell us a little bit about the process with these. Cause even on screen, you can see, um, that there's a lot happening in these. Can I add one one thing too? Also, I'm I'm really curious just because of the the first slide, what the the materials are. Like I'm really interested in. Um, I I'm just curious. <laughs> of the what the materials are of this piece? Of of all of them, actually, <laughs> you know. Whenever, yeah, yeah. It's very interesting in how you come to, you know, make a mark. You know, it's, it's just yeah. such care and consideration. Yeah. Erica, you are never wrong. So stop saying <laughs> You're never wrong. Uh, very interesting. I thought it was very interesting when you asked to move this piece to the four there, because <clears throat> I selected three of these. You know, when you talk to an artist, and they ask, you ask them, what's the most important work? And you're gonna say, oftentimes, the work you're working on right now. Mm -hmm. So this is a series that I'm working on now, that I've been started working on. And I'm gonna quickly tell you the story. I recently, my brother and my sister and I discovered that my great, 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 great grandfather, his name was Luke Valentine, whom we, you know, of course did not know, uh, that he had fought, we discovered he fought in the Revolutionary War. He was a free African man living in Lynchburg, Virginia. That's where my family's from. Again, the foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains there. And there was a small enclave of free Africans that lived there. And he was inducted into the Virginia line, right? And he, walked from Virginia to North Carolina to fight in the first battle, which they lost, right? They met up with another regiment from North Carolina. They had already kind of lost the battle. And then his regiment, the Virginia line joined it. And then they walked, marched on, no horses. They walked, they marched, they walked 
to South Carolina and they fought the second battle with the British and they won that battle. Right? So he survived that. He went back home. And, you know, he, he lived and they he was uh, inducted the second time. <laughs> so this piece, I'm going to go down a minute. I'm going to go to the first one, this one here. And I started to envision what in the world was the inner strength of this being, Luke Valentine, I call him Luke V, to what was the internal strength that this African man could walk from Virginia to North Carolina and then to South Carolina, fight the British, win, and then go back home. So I started with, I started with a poem from um, this Ruth, I don't wanna, I, I took some notes so I would not blow her name. Of course I can't find it. I started with this poem about um, a book, a poetry book, uh, the moon knows you, when the moon knows you're wandering. And I started with the blue light of home. So I started with what is it to leave home what memories and strands would you take with you? What light? And the poem said, always keep the blue light of home as you travel. So you can always kind of find your way, navigate your way back. So this was the first piece in the series, the blue light of home. And I started with this little crossroads or this zebra. And I thought about that as a wayfinder, you know, that this thing is traveling through the landscape. So I'm envisioning what did it take to travel over the landscape from Virginia, okay? This is the second one. It's called The Red Road of Dis... So I'm having, this is all paper. So I do, I'm, I'm painting on these papers. I'm uh, tearing some apart. I'm cutting apart, reassembling. I work in a very, a 300 pound paper. It's very heavy, it's very dense. And I'm really building it piece by piece, right? So it becomes a construction. Uh, this is like the road is unclear and he's finding his way. I'm imagining there's no 95, there's no roads You're cutting your way through the thicket. He's moving from the mountainous Piedmont area, area of the nation, right? And he's moving the, um, along to the shore, right? Along to Virginia Beach in that way. So he's transversing a lot of the landscape. And then this piece is called Traveling Land. So I wanted to talk about moving from the mountainous region to coastal plains. So he's, this is like, um, of course, I can't know what he experienced, but I'm trying to take an inner journey to imagine what he saw, the light that he may have experienced, some of the typography of the landscape was revealed. Uh, the animals are there. His sounds would have been present. There are no electric lights. So you're cutting your way through forests, thick forests, vines. Uh, you're trying to find water, all of those things. Uh, and then, oh, I have to go back to this one. This, here. And this one was meeting the sea. He's from the mountains. He never seen or encountered the sea. So on this march, this would, been, would have been his first encounter of seeing the sea and the fury of the coast of the waters of all of those things. Uh, I could imagine. I, as a child, I remember I never saw the sea until I moved to Philly and my mother took me to New Jersey and we went to the Atlantic Ocean. And I was like, what? There's an ocean? <laughs> what? <laughs> I, right? I mean, I saw it on the map. I saw it in the books but I had never seen it. I had never put my toes in it. I had never seen the wave come and knock you down. So I could experience. So this piece, I thought it was really poignant, Erica, that you said, 
out and put it up here. <laughs> this one for me was just like, this is the crescendo of having traveled across all of that. And then the gift from the earth is that you experience the ocean, the sea, which is a place of mystery and intrigue that will forever be present, hopefully, on this planet. Uh, so this is encountering the sea for the first time. Um, so now I'm going to go forward a little bit. There are like 13 pieces in this series. I was going to ask that. Yeah, I just like to do this one. And this one I chose, uh, this one, it's called South of the North Star. This is kind of weird. It's very narrow and tall and linear. And I thought about this, that upon returning home, we were still in the South, you know, and, and, and um, the tradition of African-American people in this country, the notion of the North Star as the guiding light, right? I thought that this piece portend the great migration to come, that African-American people, African people would indeed that North Star. They would no longer be south of the North Star. They would be north. Yeah. I thought of my family and that migration from Lynchburg to Philadelphia, to New York, to Connecticut, you know, and those are the corridors that we chose. And I thought all happening in the groundwork was laid by Luke Valentine, who had transversed this nation, this country, right? And was part of the building block. I had never thought of myself as a daughter of the American Revolution, <laughs> but uh, here we are, right? And I will forever mention the name of Luke Valentine and thing is, it's not that it's my family. Well, of course, that's important to me. But thousands, many thousands of African men who fought and marched and built and sustained and endured. And, and some didn't. But um, it's part of the fabric, right? The revealing of all of it. Um, Again, how am I doing it? It's piece by piece. I construct a painting the way you construct a 3D thing. You have to build it from the inside out. Um, this, I just got almost obsessed in a way, I hate to use words like that, but um, the, the stripes, you know, they kept, you know, Erica, you pointed them out. You know, they started out like one little thing you know, leaving home and that this would be always the thing that you could latch on to. And you know, this is in the, the, the African-American community, finding a way out of no way, making a way out of no way. So this is like the way, you find a way, there's always a way. My husband's mother, or my husband's mother's mother's, her saying was, there's a way, but you gotta find it. It's a way, but you just gotta find it. And I thought, now that's it, right? <laughs> the world is open. It's there. Whatever you need, you just got to find it. So he's finding his way and he found his way. And here we all are sitting here. Yeah. 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 So that I, was it. Sorry. No, I'm sorry. That's it. I wasn't saying anything. I know Eric and I have talked about this. I can't help but the first one, it, this it panel is a part of this narrative, but it's contained in a, in, on the paper and the rest of the story pours off of the canvas, pours, off, pulls, pours out of the paper more. Mm -hmm. um, and so I started, uh, we started comparing your work to the works of Sam Gilliam, who we have, uh, uh, sorry, we got a note from, from Miguel to hurry up. Uh, compare, I started comparing it to Sam Gilliam, who um, 
Well, we have we have works in, in, in our collection. Sam is uh, my men absolute mentor, no question about it. Sam Gilliam is, um, if, if there's a, a, a North Star, Sam Gilliam is it. Um, I, ha I had another painter say, you know, it's almost impossible to go anywhere in painting or art that Sam hasn't been. But uh, his fearlessness, uh, his composite, the way he builds structure, you know, he's a painter, but my God, he builds it from the inside out, you know, the textures, the, the tactile quality of them, the color, the, 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 the size, you know, the scale, he manages all of those things. And the works are never the same, you know. Is there something oftentimes that artists find a, a, a vision or a voice and they stay there, but he's ever churning and searching and um, I just find his work uh, extraordinary repository of um, ideas and directions and um, a symphony of, of color, of sound. It's, he touches all the bases. Um, it will take um, centuries to decode though, you know, much of his work, you know. So that, that's the, um, that's the ilk that, that Sam is, is in. And I, um, I, I know when he was teaching at Carnegie Mellon, he brought one of his key students here. She had just won a big uh, painting prize, I guess the first time. And, and um, he brought her here to Washington to meet me before she was about to start at the University of Maryland, I think, uh, to do graduate work. So it, it's, you know, there's a discourse and some of the best days that I can remember are some of our <laughs> soirees of Sam Gilliam and Percy Martin and Michael Platt and um, Simone Gouverneur and the poets, you know, libations would be flowing, <laughs> Sam would be singing, Mike would be playing the harmonica, and then you know, th this is this is the life. This is the energy of Washington. Um, I'm not even naming half the artists, but uh, Sam is central to uh, the Washington story. You know. So, Martha, I want to ask you a little bit more about some of your influences. But before we sort of switch gears to the Q, I'll just make it a Q and A question for myself. But before we switch gears, do you can you tell us a little bit about your um, last slide and this? I think it's just so you know, again, the educator and me, sort of the location of it um, and tell us a little bit about that piece. Yeah, I, I threw this in at the, the, the end because I wanted to, this is at Duke Ellington School of the Arts. And um, when I uh, left Temple University graduate in 75, I came to, um, and I started teaching at Duke Ellington School of the Arts. And this piece was commissioned by um, the DC Commission on the Arts and Humanities. But it was one of the, the last pieces that Peggy Cooper Kayfords had. I mean, I happened to be at a, a book signing and she said, we got three days to get this grant. I need someone to make something. And I'm like, Lord Jesus. <laughs> so I said, okay, I'll do it. So I had to go home, stay up all night and design a piece, okay? so. I, and, but I was, it was so important. This is Duke Ellington School of the Arts. You know, they just had this major renovation and everything. So I, this is called Conducting the Creative Path. And I wanted to do some, this is Duke Ellington, right? So I thought about the musical genius, the composer, Duke Ellington, Edward Kennedy Ellington. And I, instead of using his, the conductor's baton, I used, uh, an African walking stick. This, this form here is taken from an, an ancient African walking stick. And the, the story about having a good walking stick is, it's to help you keep your balance and to kill a lion if he, uh, to, if he comes up on you in the morning. So that top was always heavy and laden that you could use it uh, in defense of yourself. And this piece is, 
it's uh, aluminum and glad the dark pieces are hand cut blue glass tessera. And I wanted the students to know that um, to keep stepping, whatever you're doing in terms of being creative, the energy is to just keep stepping. To conduct the creative energy is to keep going, keep stepping. And um, I created it. There it is. I it, love that title so much. Yeah, yeah. It, just, what is it, dances up, yeah it dances up the side of the building. You can see it there. As all your works do. <laughs> yeah. And I wanted to have feelings of an instrument, but not to copy one, you know, to invent something else, you know, it had to be something else, you know, but I love the materials of that instruments are made of, you know, the horns, you know, uh, all of that kind of composite like thing uh, went into the piece. So I, 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 I like this piece and it was energetic and I was paying homage to uh, Duke Ellington, the sound of me, again, it almost has sound, you know, and it glistens in the sun. And I wanted to it to be a gift to Duke Ellington School, and that it should sh it should shine on that hill. And it's such a special place that young people. When I was studying to be an artist, there was no school like this, right, where you could go and as a youngster and start working and painting oils and clay and metals and printmaking and photography and museum studies. Phenomenal, phenomenal. Um, and the people who come through there, the teachers, you know, the scholars, the students, uh, it's really important, you know. Um, so to me, again, creating landmarks and Duke Ellington School of the Arts is a landmark for Washington, DC, and I wanted it, it to be embracing you know that is there yeah what a powerful last slide and a powerful message um keep keep stepping everyone yeah. We have some great questions in the Q and A. So before I get in trouble, I'm gonna, I'm gonna switch gears over to those. Um, so Emma from our education department, one of my colleagues, says it seems like um, your materials are integral to your work. Um, how do you choose your natural materials, your stones and your glass, et cetera, um, to use? And do they have a symbolic significance for you? Yeah, well, you, you know, the core of most artists, you end up collecting things, you know, collecting um, materials in a way such that you have um, a bit of a repository. And one of my favorite things is to go to stone yards and quarries. So I'm always kind of on the search for textures and stones and materials. So um, they have meaning in terms of what their character, what is, what is it about their character? So it's almost like um, staging a play, you know, you, you get the right actor, you get the right actress, you know, you, you, you get the right musician. So you have to get the right materials, you know, and each material speaks you know, in a different voice, if you will. So I'm always um, thinking about, again, those issues that we talked about, the site, how will it be seen, the scale, durability. I like to work with materials that somewhat last, you know, although nothing is really permanent. So I like that kind of walking that nice edge of what's permanent and what isn't. Um, so yes, I, I do make selections um, depending on the character of the materials and they speak, you know, it, it, it says, you know, it's either right, it's working or it's not. And then you have to be brave enough, like, oh my God, it's not working. So you have to, you know, back to the drawing board, find that thing, because in the words of the elder, there is a way, you just have to find it. <laughs> my friends are gonna get tired of me, get tired of hearing that one, because I'm gonna be using it a lot. Um, do we have yeah. another question from an attendee um, who asks, why is abstraction such a resonant mode of creating for you? You have such thorough concepts, histories, and narratives behind each piece. It seems like they could easily be representational. What does abstract art allow you to do that a representational, representational work of art would not? One word, freedom. <laughs> I value freedom. It, that, that to me is like the ultimate thing. 
and I, 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 I'm stretching, I'm trying to stretch. Abstraction allows for endless possibilities. It allows for innovation. It allows for complexity and it allows for um, an intimacy without spilling your guts. What can I say? You know, <laughs> you know there's something, I, 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 some mystery, right? I love the mystery of abstraction because you have to, you have to make discoveries. Like Erica, when you ask, I'm gonna put this in front of the children and they are so free to say, oh man, I see a horse. You see, that's a, that is clearly a dinosaur. Don't you see? <laughs> okay. So the abstraction leaves the door open for endless possibilities. Um, Configuration isn't so much my interest because I want to duplicate a thing more express the energy of a thing. If that made any sense. Abstraction allows for freedom and endless possibilities without being restricted to configuration, you know, that has to look like a thing. I'd rather it feel like a thing. Mm. I tweeted today, less of what you think and more of what you feel. <laughs> so we, we've been on the same wavelength today. Yes, <laughs> very good. That's good. We have another um, uh, question from another colleague, Catherine Rogi. And Catherine asks, when in your process do you assign titles for the work? I love this question, Catherine. Is it part of the initial concept or does it develop as you work? Because your titles are like a work of art within themselves, right? You know, it, it, it evolves, it evolves. Um, and as you're building a concept, you know, like the music of the spheres, that was so direct because, you know, you have to get there, it's its own thing. And then with Ellington, how did I get to that? It was just, um, you know, I, I work out parts of it and then by the time I get to the end, the narrative, it flows. There's something almost like, um, um, you know, um, jazz musicians, they, you know, <laughs> if you encounter them, you say, oh, I want you to come and play this. They're like, there's no practicing. You just show up and blow, right? So you have to be prepared. You know, you have this storehouse as you are building and working and it's becoming clearer. Sometimes it fades in and out. And usually I, I keep notes as I'm working. As I said, I'm usually for each piece there ends up being a, a notebook, a book of ideas, how it comes, how it reveals itself and what's kept and what isn't, right? But it's part of the, the underbelly of a piece. So there's a narrative and the words begin to uh, evolve as the piece evolves because it's, there's a story that's being told and oftentimes the, the titles, the, the story, the narrative sometimes. And of course, you don't ever have to have a title. They can fly all alone. It's just, you know, usually, you know, People want to know what's the title. I'm like, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> well, funny enough, so you know, I had to do my research to get ready. So the title of the first one is Drifting. Uh, that oh, thank you. Thank they you. have. And I think it's just like speaks to you so much, right? I was chuckling to myself. I wasn't gonna say it before, um, that you did you know, but just speaks to that movement again. It just like keeps coming up over and over and over again. And you, you do it so often, you don't even remember now, right? And I, I'm just wondering, um, do all of your, uh, so is that drifting piece, that first piece, is that also part of a series of those works? Did you sort of like use that ink over and over? Yeah, yeah, I have a whole series. You know, I, I didn't remember drifting because there was maybe 30 of them, 30 things. <laughs> You know, part of that, um, as I say, I usually work in uh, series, never just you know one thing. So um, yeah, and and they each have um, that that was 
I think when I was working on the Ancestral Bones series, that that may have been the beginning, you know, the drifting things when it was really free and moving and the choreography was um, apparent. I asked you this question when you I and Erica were talking before, but I'm gonna ask again. Yeah. Um, if you had to only use one material for the rest of your life, what material would you choose? Do you know, Nehemiah, you've been haunting my dreams. <laughs> so I just wanted to tell you that you've been haunting my dreams. Because I said, I just said, I'm going back to the, to the original clay. I want to change that. <laughs> I'm going with paper. If I had to, from right now, I'm going to choose paper. I love paper. It is, it's organic. It is a byproduct of trees, of, of wood. It's so expansive. It can come in so many forms. And I'm experiencing it as, um, I think if I had one, I'm going to say paper. Because that's a broad thing. It can be from architecture. Think about Japan and they use it in architecture. It's a, right? I mean, the wood meals, it's paper so I changed and you were haunting my dreams in the night I said I said Clay, I'm going to <laughs> I'm changing I'm, a, I'm going to text you again in a month and ask you the same question <laughs> you don't ask me that again <laughs> but officially today I'm declaring paper <laughs> Martha, I know we've talked a little bit about Sam Gilliam and just sort of his influence on you. I was wondering if you could maybe mention any other artists that we might know who you would say were influences or even mentors of yours. Yes, uh, David Driscoll, uh, uh, just a landmark uh, scholar and artist and historian and writer, humanitarian, David Driscoll. And I, he was, he's been so helpful to me right? Needing a recommendation for anything, he's there, he writes. Um, the legacy of David's scholarship, you know, being tutored by, you know, Locke and Porter and all those gentlemen of that era. And then he's just has kind of moved through time. So David Driscoll, um, Howardina Pendel, uh, a painter. Howardina has been uh, influential in that I loved her abstraction. I loved her grit. She was in museums working at the forefront for many years. Uh, she would always stand her ground she was uh, very beneficial to contemporary artists working, you know, making sure you had a place. And I appreciate her work. She works with, you know, small dots and paints and I, but big ideas. Um, William T. Williams, painter. William T. Williams, the most exacting painter with the stripes and the geometry and it's just precision. Uh, Elegance, there's something about that work. I love the work of Richard Serra. The man loves steel. I love steel. When he put those pieces at MoMA, you go in the courtyard, you know, they had to take down the wall to get it in, you know. You talk about when they had it in the, the plaza and people were like, I can't walk around this piece of steel all that long. It makes me sick. I loved it. I went there and you're walking through these things and I know most people don't realize it's gravity holding that huge steel. So I have photographs of myself. I said, now somebody photographed this in case I don't make it out of that corridor of steel, but it's just magical, you know, this cork and steel and the complexity of the scale and then the balancing of the gravity and the materials I love Sarah's work. Um, Elizabeth Catlett, you know, for me, um, 
the sculptor, you know. Uh, she did figurative things, but again, always with the level of uh, chisel perfection and, and, and abstraction, you know, I, I love her for that. Um, Shakira Booker, she just like went into a whole nother space. I love her work, the energy of it, you know, just, I love stuff. You know, we were in a, sh a show together in uh, Baltimore, the, the, um, and they were un crating her things, unpacking it, you know, and I was like, oh, the guys were like, oh, yeah, these, these tires, folks. I said, yeah, I love work that touches you back, you know, they would call it, because, you know, it's just, just the grit and the energy that that woman has put into those pieces. They are magical, you know, and they, they will touch you back. They will touch you back in many ways, physically, and they will touch your heart, you know. So, um, uh, Barbara Chase Rabot, I love her work. Um, again, a, a woman sculptor. And I don't know anyone else who takes metal and just turns it into liquid, soft forms and drapes and, you know, the magic of that elegance. And she is a complex being. She's a writer, you know, she's theater, everything, all composite. So, yeah, there, there, my, my list can just go on and on. Then the number of people who are, um, you know, I, I love artists, you know, recently we lost Michael Platt. Michael Platt was a force, you know, in this Washington community uh, in terms of um, mentoring, you know, uh, young artists and finding a way other artists who've been here to just um, make sure that the work continues. Um, there's um, any, and now the, the, a, a number of the performance artists, everything is kind of opening up. Um, freedom, right? There's freedom, you know, I love it. You know, um, you, you no longer have to call yourself a sculptor or a painter, or you're a performance artist, you're, you're something in the universe. I love that. I love that. And it's ever changing. And I'm looking to the young people to keep that verb, to keep that fire going. Um, and they're stepping up. There are any number of young artists who are just stepping up. Well, you know, we can't leave the here without giving a shout out to Ingina, who I know is sitting to the left of you. Uh, <laughs> no, she, oh, oh, she cut out. She cut out early. She okay. <laughs> but, but your, uh, daughter, your daughter is also an artist and a, and a phenomenal one um, at that. Yeah. Um, so I, I should add. Wait, I, we collaborate, and we absolutely collaborate on building the piece for Ellington. Um, so, and now. For our public art recently, we're building a piece as we speak now for the Purple Line. We're collaborating on that design. We designed it three years ago. Now we have to build it. So it's for this parapet of this bridge in um, Silver Spring. So um, we have our work cut out for us. But Ingina is um, a, a graduate of Duke Ellington School of the Art and she, the School of the Arts, and she went on to the Cooper Union, um, finished the Cooper Union, and travel the world, you're performing as a performance artist. And, and, and now she's back, she shares a studio. Uh, well, she has her own studio, but in the same building. And um, we're collaborating. <laughs> and I love it, you know, talking about the youth and the energy, you know, she has, she has the energy, she has the vision and she has the, um, the verb, you know, um, and the ingenuity, you know, how to think on your feet and how to put Put the puzzle together, you know. She reminds me of my grandfather that I said would go into the little house and come out with what was necessary. She has that same gift. She can build it. She can build anything. The irony is that when she was young, I'd be dragging her with me to, for some installation that I had to build, some talk at a museum, some project I was building, and she would go along and everyone would be working and Ingina would be sleeping under the sculpture on top of the sculpture beside the sculpture 
And then we get in the truck to come home. She says, oh, I could have done that. Let me tell you how I could have done it. I would have done this different. This is how I would do it. And she still does that today. But now she can back it up. And my last, last question, uh, if you describe your art using only one word, what do you use? One word? One word. Sum it all up. Boy, you are tough. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm going to have nightmares. <laughs> maybe, maybe we'll save that for part two of our, of our conversation and give you some time to think about whenever that happens. Energy. Energy. Okay. Energy. You know, I read a quote recently that energy is a scientific word for spirit. I'm going to leave you with that. <laughs> I think that's uh, perfect for you, too. I think that sums up so much of, of what I've come to really enjoy about you in these last couple of conversations, your spirit. And I think it's present in your artwork. It's present in conversation with you. You just feel it. I think in the same ways that we sort of feel the energy off your art. So I think that is a, a perfect ending. Um, I just want to thank you and Nehemiah for letting me sort of insert myself into this conversation. Uh, people may not know that this was originally a conversation between Nehemiah and Martha and the three of us got online and I asked so many questions and said, just come and join us for the conversation. <laughs> so I just want to thank you two artists for letting this educator slide in um, and talk with y'all. It has been wonderful this evening. Um, did either of you want to leave us with any uh, parting words before I say goodbye to our audience? I just, just want to say you, thank you, Erica. Oops, thank sorry. you, Erica. I just want to say thank you, Erica. Thank you, Nehemiah. And thank you, the Phillips. Martha, I can't wait to see you in your studio soon when it's safe to do so. Um, Erica, makes... I can't wait to take you there. Yeah, you Absolutely. got ready. I'm ready. Um, and we just like to thank all of you for being here with us this evening. You know, in this Zoom world, you could literally be anywhere in the world and you've been spending this uh, evening with us. And so we appreciate you all. We appreciate the support from our members. Um, please check out our website. A video of this talk will be available later on on our YouTube channel. And join us next time for Conversations with Artists. Y'all have a wonderful evening. Bye, everyone. Bye.